So there I was, minding my own business when my fiance decided we were going to watch anime on Netflix. That's something I don't generally do unless it's Doro Hedoro or, you know, people beg for a video on Violet Evergarden and then nobody watches it. And then what does she do? She puts on a slice of life about a four-year-old kid who lives by himself. And then I proceeded to binge the entire series. Kotaro, and yes, I know it's pronounced Kotaro, but I speak English, okay? Lives Alone is a major standout. Me and Slice of Life anime have a bit of a weird relationship. Like, I don't hate the genre by any means, but if I'm going to watch it, there's generally incentive, like anime boobies and very artistic cameramen. And it's cause I'm an animal, okay? You can judge me all you want. But yeah, I like rom-com etchy, comedy etchy, and some Sometimes they're more family friendly variants like Kaguya sama or Umaru chan. Occasionally, I will watch something deliberately designed to make me cry, like March Comes In Like a Lion. We're gonna do a video on that later this year. But Kotaro Lives Alone just sucked me in. Why does he have snake eyes? Why does he wear a shirt that says God on it? And why does he live? alone. We don't learn about the eye choice, but the rest is doled out beautifully as the narrative progresses through Kotaro-chan himself, as well as a lovable cast of characters, each with their own unique personalities and personal challenges to overcome. The series is a mix of comedy and absolutely heart-wrenching moments that, yeah, it made my grown ass cry. And I'm not a huge cry guy either, okay? I saw Wolf Children and I just, I f***ing laughed. So you know, uh, do with that info what you will. Either way, I loved the experience so much that I wanted to share it with all of you while I am working on a giant video on Cross Game. Another series that, yeah, then made me cry. April Showers, am I right? Anyway, this is Kotaro Lives Alone. Let's get into it. <laughs> Hi everyone, real quick, this is Mike, the voice in the video. If maybe you've noticed recently that we have been putting out more content. Only reason that we're able to do that is because of two things, our amazing patrons, and of course, our partnership that's been ongoing with G Fuel. So if G Fuel is your drink of choice, please use our code BPOP, B-P-O-P, and right now it's 30% off. Now if that's not your thing, that's fine, but man, the Patreon, that's another option. Not only do you get to help contribute to the speed at which we're able to make content, but you're also helping to pay editors what they're worth, and that's why this took so long. It's it's you have to have a certain amount of money to be able to pay people to do the job. And on top of that, you get to be a part of like the chillest community on the web. And I'm not just saying that we have like, we have pages and pages and pages of people saying how much they're enjoying and loving being in the discord. I mean, you tell me another group of like 900 people that just get along. Anyway, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for your time and on with the video. So Kotaro lives alone in a small apartment building. He talks like a Sengoku era samurai and has enough money to get by alone. So the first thing you should be asking yourself is how the f is a four year old living on his own, right? Like that sounds crazy. How are you going to have an anime that's all about the important things I'm going to talk about when the entire premise is bullshit? Well, as always, it's important to remember that Japan is a different place. Unless you're there, then it is the same place. Point is, the situation is actually possible. Likely, no, but technically possible. And I'm sure we've all seen a high school centered anime right the kids they all live alone or their parents are just always gone this is actually a thing it's common enough not to be strange at all technically you have to be 20 to rent in japan but these rules are extremely loose minors can get parental consent and documentation of financial stability are required but kids can live on their own the reason we see this with high school anime so much is because japanese high school is far closer to american college and fun fact it's also only three years regardless Regardless, high schools in Japan are extremely competitive, and it's generally more important that your child goes to the best one they can get into rather than where it is. Some have dorms, others don't, thus alternative living arrangements are made. However, Kotaro is a four-year-old, so clearly there's something else going on here. Well, again, Japan is culturally different, okay? This is gonna be an ongoing thing. As a whole, it is generally considered a safe place. Some of that is true, some of it is propaganda, but it's generally safe enough that giving children as young as six autonomy is common. Cooking, staying at home alone, going out alone, even riding trains at six years old is totally normal and is fostered by the community. So with all of this in mind, while Kotaro is exceptionally young, given the right consent and circumstances, his situation, living alone, Alone is oddly possible. So let's finally talk about him. Right from the get-go, it is pretty obvious that there is some dark shit going down 
in this anime, right? We first meet Kotaro shopping for tissues, specifically boxed ones, as customary gifts for his new neighbors. The main focus is going to be on his direct neighbor, Karino, a 31-year-old single male and failing manga artist. He definitely comes off as an aloof bum, but something about a random kid showing up at his door, wondering where the bath in his new apartment is supposed to be, piques this guy's curiosity. I mean, it makes sense. It's not like your first thought on meeting a four-year-old would be that he's totally on his own. But when Kotaro learns that there's no baths in the apartment and he has to go to the local bathhouse, he promptly heads off alone that evening to do so. Meanwhile, Karino is watching the news, which is doing a feature on abducted children, and realizes he just let a kid walk off on his own at night. He then finds himself at the bathhouse with Kotaro, which is again totally normal in Japan, and helping the poor kid wash his hair. And this is when Kotaro admits that it's been a long time since anyone has washed his hair and everyone who watched this show felt like they wanted to die. Then, while walking home later that night, Karino asks Kotaro about his parents and gets a vague answer that they're just not around anymore. To which he reveals that he lost his own parents in an accident when he was young. And after a moment of silence, Kotaro says, You must be lonely. And that's when everybody who watched this show realized that they were in the shit and it was too late. Now the anime doesn't exist simply to give you lumps in your throat, okay? There is a really good amount of levity, some of it immediately after a heart-wrenching moment like that. You see, Kotaro is a bit of a tsundere. He tends to shut people up with blatant observations or denials on their attempts to pity him. He's rejective of blatant affection and prides himself on his strength and independence. So he tends to work towards not making people feel like they have to help him, either that or he'll do something pure-hearted or goofy to remind you that he is still just a little kid. For instance, one day he finds his neighbor Mizuki passed out in her doorway covered in booze and just runs to the store for ice. And you're stuck bewildered with Karino chasing him down. On the way, he trips on his face and it sits there and shakes a little bit, but he refuses to cry. He says he doesn't like crying. But when he arrives back at Mizuki's, he gives her a frozen bottle and instructs her to put it on her eyes to help relieve the pain from crying, and that it's okay to cry, and that he won't be mad at her if she cries when she denies having done so. Both adults are left there amazed at the perceptiveness of this weirdo four-year-old. Karino himself didn't even notice that Mizuki's eyes were puffy in the first place. When he asks him how he knew she was crying, Kotaro admits that he's seen adults cry a lot. And of course, we all choked up. But then he follows that up with, a popular man has many burdens. And that's part of the beauty of the show. It's easy, okay, to make people sad, but it's hard to make being sad enjoyable, relatable, and also kind of funny. Because of the comedic whiplash and its multi-situation episode structure, Kotaro Lives Alone is super bingeable. It's just situation after situation and you do not want it to stop. You want to keep learning more about this kid, seeing what his neighbors are going to do and how they're going to react to him, why he is in this situation, and of course watching the adults around him navigate their relationships and feelings for him. Like Kotaro's downstairs neighbor, he is a Yakuza named Tamaru who perpetually lives in a purple leopard print suit which I am incredibly jealous of, and he also has an estranged wife who hates him and a son he's not allowed to see. But he loves his kid and basically all kids in general, which means he loves giving Kotaro hugs, which freaks Kotaro out, making Karino realize that Kotaro has never really been touched beyond the bare minimum before. I mentioned earlier that he talks like a Sengoku period samurai or a feudal lord, like he says, and this is because he loves a very unpopular and particularly bad anime called Tonosama. When he first moves in, he doesn't have a TV, so Karino begrudgingly lets him watch the show over his place at night, and the whole time, Kotaro mimics everything Tono Saman says, he sits too close to the TV, he listens to it turned all the way up, and then he admits that the story isn't very good and that he doesn't even really like the character Tono Saman that much. It's just special to him for some reason. And when a boy at the bathhouse is misbehaving for his father during that conversation, Kotaro goes up to him and says that he should be happy that he has someone to take care of him, that he's lucky, and that he probably doesn't need the TV in the middle of the night. Then the next day, Kotaro pays people 10 yen to watch him reenact scenes from Tonosaman, but only if it makes him smile. And then he thinks about a time he did this for a woman in his house, and she smiled at him. And then he remarks that paying 10 yen isn't enough. Eventually, when Tonosaman gets cancelled, Karino asks Kotaro if he's going to be okay without the TV at night, and Kotaro says that he's already told Karino that he doesn't need it anymore. And next, we see Kotaro in bed, smiling and listening to Karino snoring in the apartment next door as he drifts off to sleep. Yeah.
So at this point, we still have no idea what really happened to Kotaro's parents or why he's in the situation that he's in, but what we do know, especially from that first conversation with Karino on the way home from the bath, is that Kotaro is lonely. And loneliness comes in a lot of forms. You may be surrounded by people all the time and feel totally alone, or you could be actually isolated. Maybe it's hard to find people that share your interests or you don't fit in where you live. But from what I remember, being lonely as a kid was a different sensation. At that age, you don't have a grasp on the future, right? Time moves slower because every second is a much larger fraction of your life than it is now as an adult. Loneliness as a kid is almost a sensation of oncoming doom. And it's made clear through Kotaro's memory of the smiling woman that he wasn't always on his own, but that doesn't mean he wasn't lonely then too, because loneliness doesn't necessitate physical isolation. And it's really hard with a series like this not to go over every occurrence because everything leads into something else. The revelations are so good because you get bits and pieces of the story through Kotaro's words and actions, little snippets of how he really feels through social mistakes that he makes. Like in episode two, when the bath closes down, he won't let anyone near him. Nobody gets why and they become frustrated until the realization dawns that Kotaro probably had a bad experience with being dirty or was at least considered to be so. And the full story of this isn't revealed until episode 8, six episodes later when he turns his room into a mini museum of his treasures for his neighbors. And one such treasure is a box of rubber gloves. His new neighbor, Mrs. Take, asks about them, and he says he treasures them because they're the ones his mother wore when she would touch him. And just... Oh god. But this is a real thing, okay? It happens in real life to real mothers and real children. It isn't the show being super sad for the sake of being sad and getting tear points. Take, though, is really triggered by Kotaro's admission because her mother also wouldn't touch her without gloves. Now, most people probably see this and think, oh, what terrible mothers. And that makes sense. It's an awful way to treat a child. But what we're actually seeing here is a symptom of untreated postpartum depression. This is probably a word you've heard before, but likely no more than constituting, you know, the baby blues. However, postpartum depression, now called peripartum, affects most mothers to some degree. And if left untreated, it can develop into a severe depression, which is treatable but dangerous. And there's also outside factors that can negatively influence this condition, make it worse. Things like lack of social support, monetary instability, and especially domestic problems with the father. Symptoms of peripartum can go from mild to severe, but can lead to complete detachment from the child due to a feeling of lacking a motherly bond. Depression is bad enough, but because of the massive physical and hormonal changes involved in pregnancy and childbirth, peripartum is very difficult to overcome alone. Mothers can feel hopeless, detached, and in this case, a sense of disgust or fear of their child. The thought of this happening, and especially the occurrence of it, is socially stigmatized. Doing research on this topic was almost impossible. A mother who can't care for herself or her child is immediately viewed as a failure despite whether it's her fault or not. The not in this case being the failing of professionals to appropriately diagnose and treat a common affliction, and the failing of society to accept that this is something that can happen. People who reach out for help are usually treated like monsters or not even believed because how could you possibly not love your baby? It is undoubtedly awful for the child in question in these scenarios. We know this. That's what gets the attention. That's what gets the state involved. However, the self-loathing and isolation it can cause for the sufferer of peripartum. Well, Kotaro's mother is dead. Let's just put it that way. And Kotaro doesn't even know. Now, this is speculation. I have not read the manga. I haven't touched it. Why she's dead isn't revealed in the show, but I'm willing to bet money that I'm on the ball and I got a Benny down on suicide. And this is why I love anime. Not because of how terrible all of this stuff is, but because shows like this get greenlit. The reason all of this is so shocking is because people don't 
talk about it. One in nine mothers suffer from some form of lasting postpartum emotional effects, but the ones who get treated are only a fraction of the sufferers. While Kotaro Lives Alone is a story about an abused and neglected child, it's also a story about society failing a family. It's a show about topics people want to ignore so they can go on with their pretty little lives, and one that's so good and nuanced about revealing these topics that it's actually bingeable. If you take the time to look into the few flashbacks were given about Kotaro and his mother and his reactions to them, you can easily see her suffering through his suffering. He still loves her to this day because, well let's be honest, he's unrealistically emotionally intelligent, but he saw that she was suffering and appreciated everything she was able to force herself to do, even if she had to wear gloves to hold him. The one time he was playing Tonosaman and she smiled, even just a little, was worth him paying people to replicate. It's tragic, but it's so damn good it hurts. And Kotaro's altruism is incredibly infectious, and it's obvious that while being completely broken, he is a genuinely good-hearted kid who still carries a ton of innocence without even trying, without even asking for it. His entire apartment complex comes together for him as a support network. When he starts kindergarten, uh, and there's three years of kindergarten in Japan, you start around three or four years old, he goes alone in secret, and while all the other kids are with their parents, he sits alone and he's embarrassed about the way he put on his badge. And meanwhile, the adults back at the apartment are finally realizing where he actually went, as he tells the kid next to him that his parents are ninjas and are pretending to be a chair. But of course, all the adults rush over to the kindergarten to support Kotaro in a very sweet moment, which is just one of many in such a short season. And you may be wondering why he chooses to suffer alone like this instead of leaning on his neighbors, who clearly love being around him, but it's important to remember that Kotaro is just a kid. He's just a kid whose entire existence has revolved around being rejected. He doesn't understand that people want to help him because he doesn't understand why people would want to help him or even be around him. Part of his experience with his neighbors as the adults in his life is learning to be vulnerable, which is something he's naturally extremely adverse to because of the circumstances of his upbringing. And regarding that, I think one of my favorite aspects of the series and one that is so well done is the different views it presents on love. For instance, one day Tamaru's estranged kid shows up to see his dad. He's all yakuza dao, obviously an attempt to impress his dad, who for the record we're told he hates earlier in the show, but it turns out this kid loves Tamaru and his mom has actually been keeping him away from him. However, when Tamaru shows up to find his son hanging out with Kotaro, he becomes very stern and immediately and coldly sends his son home despite crushing his feelings. After getting stabbed by Kotaru's fake sword, Tamaru explains that he wanted nothing more than to see his kid, but it's more important that he grows up to be a man that doesn't break the rules just because he can. And in that moment, Kotaru realizes that this is Tamaru's way of showing love, without even understanding a thing about him being a Yakuza. At another point, Kotaru goes with Karino to visit his editor, and this guy, he might be my favorite character in the show, he's so dead inside. It's, it's amazing. Oh, ha 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 ha. But the reason Kotaro wants to go in the first place is because he hears Karino talking about how the editor is so harsh with him. And when Karino excuses himself to the restroom, Kotaro asks the editor not to be so mean to, to his Karino. The editor then explains that he's harsh because he believes in Karino and has high expectations of him, but Karino is a bum and needs a push, so that's his only choice and Kotaro understands and respects that level of care and that that's how the editor loves Karino and then proceeds to tell Karino to work harder to make sure his editor doesn't leave him. In this case, Kotaro was trying to protect Karino due to their slow burning but growing relationship and at the same time starts taking the role of caregiver instead of allowing that role to be reversed onto him. It's an obvious sign of a continuing issue of trust towards adults. That being said, I think Karino is great. I think without even noticing it, he steps up more and more to take care of Kotaro, or at least be there for him. And not necessarily out of a sense of responsibility, but more just because that's what you do? I mean, what would you do? Here's a good kid who's so lonely. Are you not going to walk him to and from school? Are you not going to accompany him to the baths at night? Think about what it was like when you were a kid. Were you scared of the dark? Are you going to leave a four-year-old alone to deal with that? With the art style, 
style and focus on a child, Kotaro Lives Alone looks like a kid's show from the outside, but when you go through it, A, it is very obvious that it isn't, and B, it quickly becomes clear that you are actually meant to relate to the adults in this situation. You become one of the tenants, and when they do something to support Kotaro, it makes you feel good because it feels right. It's what you would do. The way they die inside a little when Kotaro lets some dark shit come out of his mouth is how you feel when that happens. Choosing Karino as the main adult focus point and most important relationship for Kotaro is also kind of a genius move because let's be honest, we're all probably watching this show in our sweatpants like a bunch of bumps. Sorry to call you out like that. But as far as the adults allowing Kotaro into their lives, maybe it sounds weird from an American standpoint, but this, again, is something that actually happens a lot in Japan. Of course, there's different strokes for different folks, some people not into stray kids, but there's an issue regarding what's known as Hochigo on the island. Now, before Kotaro lived alone, he was a Hochigo, essentially a lonely child. Now, Kotaro's father was abusive and his mother was neglectful, so Kotaro was pretty much free to do what he wanted when he wanted, so what he did was go to strangers' houses. This is actually a thing and has been happening more frequently over the years in Japan. It is documented, you can look it up. And like I said earlier, Japan is a country where, for the most part, it is safe for children to kind of roam free. The difference is, Hochigo are neglected children, desperate for companionship and relationships relief from their loneliness. Some are straight up neglected, i.e. not fed, not talked to, not cared for, but some just live with parents who simply can't be around most of the time due to their finances and work responsibilities. And we see another set of Hochigo in the show that I'm not going to get into, but as another example of foreshadowing in Kotaro Lives Alone, which is done so well, the tissues he buys his new neighbors in episode 1 are symbolic. To Kotaro, who is neglected to the point of starvation, tissues are comforting because he used to eat them. Again, this is not something most of us would think about, but consumption of tissues is actually a fucking thing, especially for Hulchiko. Now, unfortunately, there's no nutritional value in tissues, and you can't digest them really. The purpose of eating them is actually much darker. They simply curb starvation pangs. Believe it or not, this is also a tactic used by runway models. It is a fact that you actually cannot get that skinny. The only way to do it is to stop eating, so these women stave off starvation by eating tissue paper. So the tissues are circled back on much later when Karino realizes that this is why Kotaro compulsively buys them, especially this one brand when Kotaro says they taste the best. Thankfully, Karino is able to make Kotaro realize he doesn't need them anymore because thanks to his inheritance from his mother, he can afford real food and doesn't need to be scared of starving anymore. He can let it go. And I think that's the last thing that I really want to discuss. Kotaro is living alone because of two reasons. First, unbeknownst to him, his mother passed away and she left him an inheritance. And second, his father became abusive towards him and he needs to be concealed. He needed to be removed from his orphanage because his father found where he was and they feared for Kotaro's safety. Now, Kotaro's love for both of his parents is shown repeatedly throughout the short first season and it's kind of soul crushing. It's super easy to hate them. The first time I watched through, I definitely did, but after watching again and doing the research that I needed to do for this video, I realized that this situation, this story, is deeply complicated. Now, despite being a bad father, Kotaro's dad wants him back, to the point where he'll spend money to hire a PI to track the kid down. And while we condemn him for his abusive behavior, and rightfully so, doesn't the fact that he wants Kotaro back say something? I mean, think of the fathers in this world who simply walk away from their families, the ones who simply don't bother with the kids they leave behind. It's also shown that Kotaro's dad wasn't always abusive. We don't know what happened or how things changed, but the fact remains that not all of Kotaro's memories of him are bad, and I don't think it's going too far to say that Kotaro's father loves him. It doesn't make him a good person or his actions excusable, and it's not enough for Kotaro to think he'd be okay going back with him, not now at least, but that love is still there. And his mother, right, who neglected him, let him starve, and couldn't even touch him without gloves, and likely killed herself 
left him everything she had. She had her life insurance in his name, not his father's. And while she herself wasn't able to take care of him, is she not in some way taking care of him still the best she could? To leave Kotaro with options and a security blanket in her absence, couldn't that be a form of love? And if that is the case, is Kotaro so broken for hanging on to that? Or is it me who watched this once through and got mad at these piece of shit parents, the one who's jaded and takes love for granted? Am I the one who judged and condemned off of my own personal bias, who thought Kotaro is a fucked up little kid who doesn't know how crap his parents were and saw his love for them as sad instead of beautiful or instead of pure and innocent? This is why I love anime because it's so expansive and broad because it's generally based off of comics from another culture that loves comics so much they're written about literally anything and everything there are creators out there who care about the questions i've been led to ask myself after looking into their work who care enough to write intricate stories about important things most of us ignore stories that because they were given a chance prove themselves so good that they can't be ignored and then get greenlit for television. It's truly an amazing thing. And I'm so glad that I watched Kotaro Lives Alone. And my hat goes off to Mami Sumura, who not only writes but illustrates Kotaro Lives Alone for Big Comic Superior and to Shogakukan for publishing the series. I'm very much looking forward to where the story is gonna take us next. And I hope this video, you know, maybe got you to think about it a little bit differently. But that's all. I would like to thank our high tier patron of the week, Big G, and our lucky patron of the week, Mr. Popo. If you like this video, I definitely recommend checking out a couple more. And if you like those, maybe giving us a subscription. Again, if you're enjoying seeing more content from us more often, the Patreon is the way to ensure that stays. We're likely going to have one more video before Cross Game, but please do yourself a favor and read the first volume of Cross Game. It is so good. I'm very excited about this project. And as always, thank you so much for watching. My name is Mike. This is Bonsai Pop, and I'll see you next time. Bye.